Intercease Highway runs from Miami to the tip of the Florida Keys. From the glittering Art Deco neon of Miami's South Beach to glass-bottomed boats and reefs waiting to be explored. To turtles waiting to be stitched up and put back into the water. And deer no larger than a German shepherd. Come with us as we juggle how to see it all before the sun sets on Great Drives to Florida Keys. Our journey begins in Miami. Of course, we needed the right car to explore this flashy, color-drenched city. Oh, a baby great. blue Lamborghini Gallardo Spider or convertible, seemed like the right choice. The car is so beautiful. I like that car. We are going to tour Miami, and uh, we're going to go into the less traveled road. We're going to see a lot of things that most people don't see. No matter where you are, you're close to the water in Miami. Miami's gleaming business district is surrounded by tree-lined residential neighborhoods. Grand old homes that have soared in value as people started to reawaken to the city's charm. To find an iconic view of the Miami skyline, we headed for the Rickenbacker Causeway. This smooth toll road gave us a chance to let the Lambo strut its stuff. We rolled into one of the many beach parks along the way. Miami is awash in miles of beaches, many surprisingly uncrowded. Biscayne Bay beckoned. We couldn't resist its call. The water and the views have been luring people to Miami for a long time. We were headed back across the causeway and down South Bayshore Drive. The Vizcaya Mansion was the winter retreat for one of America's Gilded Age millionaires, James Deering. He opted for Italian Renaissance splendor when he created this grand estate between 1914 and 1916. His dream home began to crumble after his death. Miami-Dade County took over in 1952 and now maintains the home and garden as a park and museum. It's a popular place for weddings and celebrations. Miami is a surprising mix of neighborhoods, from urban to suburban and close-in countryside. Deering wasn't the last millionaire to be attracted to Miami's sparkling water. One neighborhood of high-rise condos along Miami Beach is called Millionaire's Row. Its high-rise towers ooze opulence. But South Beach became our favorite neighborhood. Its main street, Ocean Drive, is lined with restored Art Deco hotels, apartments, shops, and restaurants. Check out the Art Deco District's Welcome Center and sign up for a docent-led tour or head out on your own with a self-guided audio tour. Both tours give you a well-informed introduction to the one-square-mile Art Deco District. Its 800 significant buildings are the country's largest collection of Art Deco architecture. His style first became popular in France in the 1920s and caught on with Miami architects. They added elements of tropical whimsy with a symmetrical, modern, streamlined, aerodynamic form to create a unique Deco interpretation. But one of the most popular sites on Ocean Drive isn't Deco at all. 
It's the decadent Versace Mansion. Of course, there is a beach in South Beach. Right across the street from the cool architecture is a perfect place to cool off. You'll probably want to stay in one of the Art Deco hotels. We chose the restored Hotel Victor. While it's historic, it's a thoroughly modern hotel, right in the center of the South Beach action. Of course, the Victor's pool might be all you need. But if you want to get into the swim of things, the hotel's vibe manager will set it up. A vibe manager is somebody who oversees the concierge and makes sure that we're on top of things with the local haunts as well as the new and upcoming restaurants and lounges. And it's really the guest contact. We phone each guest seven days prior to arrival to introduce ourselves and see if they want to make an itinerary. 20 minutes after they arrive, we phone to see if they're comfortable and all arrangements have been made. The whole experience here at Hotel Victor is about provoking your senses. Our senses were provoked that night. Neon replaced sunshine and the area came alive. The vibe is definitely an outdoor, tropical, neon-charged party. Lots of restaurants and people watching add to the fun. adventure awaited. It was time to hit the road. The next day we once again crossed the MacArthur Causeway and started our journey down to the Keys. The expressway turned into a scenic section of U.S. Highway 1, the 113 mile overseas highway. The highway connects the 800 Keys or islands with a series of elevated causeways. On one side the Atlantic Ocean and on the other Gulf of Mexico. To paraphrase Bobby McFerrin, don't hurry, be happy. The road is often only two lanes wide and traffic can get backed up, but there's always something to see. We traded in the Lamborghini for a more practical VW Phaeton. This part of the drive was about comfort rather than speed. <sighs> Key Largo, the longest key, it's only six feet above sea level. To get a look at what lies below, we signed up for a trip on a glass bottom boat. We were surprised to find the African Queen. The boat was originally owned by an African railroad, which rented it to director John Huston for use in his famous 1951 film starring Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn. The owner of the glass bottom boat found it rotting on a farm in Ocala, Florida and bought it. Our boat quickly filled up with a group of fellow tourists. Security, security. Key Largo Princess outbound, Key Largo Harbor Canal, leave it at us. Soon we were headed out for a trip to the coral reef. Within half an hour, we were hovering over the Molasses Reef. So we're here, this reef is called Molasses Reef, like the syrup. Got its name around the turn of the century with a Jamaican cargo vessel carrying a cargo of molasses right around here. The backbone of the reef is coral, a primitive life form just one step up from a sponge. The Florida Keys are the only places in North America with coral reefs. These reefs support a thriving and diverse array of plants and animals, much like an underwater tropical rainforest. The fear is that global warming will melt the polar ice caps and we'll have to tour all of the keys in a glass bottom boat. The temperature change could also do irreparable damage to these reefs. One of the best ways to see the area's underwater splendor is to jump in. Diving really opens up this world. Getting a close-up look at this silent seascape 
full of colorful corals and swaying plants is a tree. Our week trip was over and we were soon back on our journey south. Next stop, Robbie's Marina. Now this is what I thought the keys looked like. Ramshackle hideaway with a little attitude thrown in. We were here to catch a skip off the Lignan Vita Key. Go ahead and kick it up a little bit. Get you out to the key. Hauling tourists out to an island didn't seem like bad duty. Our definition of work in the Florida Keys is a very broad definition of work. Besides having an opportunity to be on the water, we wanted to see Lignum Vita Key. Once a haven for conquistadors, pirates, hermits, and the anti-Castro movement, we decided to visit because of its virgin tropical rainforest. Our first stop was an orientation with the park ranger. He explained that the key's namesake, Lignum Vita, is a unique and valuable hardwood. Europeans thought its oils could cure syphilis. Unfortunately, it only made the symptoms go away and not the disease. But it did have other uses. Parts and pieces to your boat made from lignum vita fine um, bearings. In fact, the, uh, the first atomic submarine, the Nautilus, had lignum vita bearings. The ranger station is housed in a cottage built in 1919 by W.J. Matheson to house the island's caretakers. Matheson was a wealthy chemist who bought this key as well as Key Biscayne. It's changed very little since then. A windmill once generated the power and fresh water came from a cistern supplied by rainwater. The state took over in 1970 and has run it as a park ever since. Its unique vegetation didn't disappear. Most of the other keys have lost their native plants. Trees and bushes with strange names. Strangler fig, mastic, pigeon plum, gumbo limbo, and one you need to watch for, poison wood. This is poison wood. Supposedly five times stronger than poison ivy. It's got that calico look with the, uh, the orange bark underneath there. Some of the names show a disdain for the comfort of tourists called a tourist tree mm -hmm. because it's all red and peely. <laughs> we also found examples of the key's namesake. This isolated island is full of history and gives visitors a chance to experience a living museum. Far too soon, we were back on the boat. Everybody's happy there. Hello, Pretending we're flying across the beautiful Florida Keys. Oh, no, we are flying across the beautiful Florida Keys. Right, I knew that. There were no complaints. That was interesting. We hoped there was still a chance for a little beach time after we checked into the hotel. Keeping our Arbor Walk theme alive, we took the hotel's nature trail to its beach. The sun was still shining and we hit the beach. It's so easy to get hooked on the key. The next day, we were off to the Turtle Hospital in Marathon. It's the only certified hospital in the world for sea turtles. It's staffed by volunteers dedicated to helping injured turtles get back into the swim of things. There's always a new patient coming in. They get about 75 cases a year. This one arrived just before us. They thought it might be an infection caused by a red tide. It was being prepped for an examination. The first step is to remove all the barnacles from its shell. Richie Moretti has been running the hospital since 1986. It started out as a sea life education project. Back in the mid-80s, we had something called the Ninja Turtles. 
and all the children in the world were excited by Ninja Turtles. So they would come in here to learn about fish and they wanted to know about turtles. Well, we asked the state, I said, how do we go ahead and get turtles for our educational pond? Well, they said, the only way you could have turtles that are endangered is do something for them. I said, well, I know a hook when I hear it. What do you need? And they said, well, we need a rehabber. I said, well, what's a rehabber? Well, a rehabber, you take the turtle. If it gets hit by a boat, you take it to the vet and you pay the bill. You buy the food, you pay the bill. You buy the medicine, you pay the bill. And when it's well, you turn it loose back in the ocean. I said, I can do that. And that's how we wound up the turtle hospital. For several years, Richie operated the hospital as a part-time volunteer out of his hidden harbor motel. Eventually, he closed the motel and turned it into a full-time hospital. Richie's passion caught on, and today a band of surgeon volunteers operate on injured turtles. Pilots donate their time to fly in patients, and community members keep things running. If we needed an MRI, we'd have somebody take the turtle to Gainesville on the plane this afternoon. Our local hospital will do a CAT scan for us while we wait. They built a large saltwater pool as part of a rehab center. The hospital is a popular stop for visitors. Individual tanks hold some of the more critically injured turtles. As we walk down this road, this turtle has been getting a whole lot of physical therapy. You can see her body is caved in on the bottom. She went a long time with no food. Uh, she got tangled up on some fishing lines. And the fishing line, and we had to make her use that flipper. She doesn't like me because I had to make her just, she didn't want to use it. But if she didn't use it, we would have had to cut it off. Because you can see the fishing line, the fishing line went all the way around the flipper. And it was swollen about twice its size. Okay, beat me up. Beat me up. It's all right. I deserve it. This turtle has a different problem. This is a hawk's bell. And this one man had no part of. This one got in a fight with a, a shark, and it took off half of her right front flipper. And you can see we took the rest of it off to make it clean. Yes, we did. And she had a shark tooth that was stuck in this flipper. See how swollen it is? But over the last year, the swelling's going down. And now we have to start on some swimming lessons. because And she'll be fine. It'll just take, oh, a month or two of people working with her, making her use that flipper. And she'll start using her rear flipper with her left front. And then she'll be able to swim in a straight line. But right now, she just likes people bringing her her food, huh? Yeah, and there's no sharks in here to bother you, are there? Good girl. Turtles have been around for over 200 million years. And with the help of Richie and his crew, they won't go extinct. Our goal is very simple. We just want future generations to see a turtle. And this is a little green turtle. And she'll live hopefully 100 years if we can get her through this, huh? About two miles west of the Turtle Hospital is Pigeon Key, the site of the remnants of a seven-mile railroad bridge. In 1935, a hurricane destroyed the bridge. A new bridge for automobiles was built. Sixteen miles south of Pigeon Key is Big Pine Key in the National Key Deer Refuge Center. We stopped here to find out how to spot the famous key deer a dwarf species. We turned down Key Deer Boulevard and started our quest. We first come to an old quarry, Blue Hole. That's the oldest body of fresh water in the key. It's not a place to take a dip. It's home to alligators, fish, turtles, and birds. We were told that another freshwater pool attracts the key deer. These pools, or lenses, as they are called, are hardened limestone caps that collect rainwater. Without them, there would be no deer. We knew we were getting close. Finally, near dusk, we spotted a deer coming out of the brush to graze. The deer's ancestors were stranded here thousands of years ago when the keys were cut off from the mainland. They're the cutest little deer. 
They're no bigger than a German Shepherd. Oh my! Scientists believe they evolved a much smaller size because there isn't as much food as on the mainland, so smaller deer were more likely to survive. To some, this area is paradise. <laughs> There is no shortage of fine hotels and resorts in the Keys. We found Tranquility Bay and Marathon lived up to its name. It's an array of two and three bedroom beach townhomes overlooking the Gulf of Mexico. It's surrounded by acres of white sand on the resort's private beach. Perfect for kayaking or just gazing. There's also a pool for a change of pace. The townhouses are ready for a move-in. But we had to move on. It was time to visit an area that has as many detractors as it does defenders. Key West, the southernmost point in the U.S. Some of the Keys call it Key Weird. It's derided as a tacky tourist magnet, but we wanted to see it. We're actually closer to Cuba now than we are to the Florida mainland. We're located on the northern edge of the Caribbean basin. Most first-time tourists hop on one of the trams for an orientation tour. It didn't take long to see what people meant by Key Weird. <laughs> we were in Old Town, that part of Key West that attracts the tourists. Old Town's low-rise wooden architecture is a throwback to another time. You can still find people hand-making cigars. Over the years, Key West has attracted such notables as Ernest Hemingway, who loved the climate and the fishing. He lived in this house from 1931 to 1940. The lighthouse, built in 1847, offers a terrific view of the Keys. Who hasn't dreamed of finding buried treasure? Mel Fisher actually did. You can see some of his hoard at the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum. Coins, jewels, and more were recovered from the wrecks of two Spanish galleons. It's enough to give you a bad case of emerald envy. The tour continued to the southernmost point in the U.S. It's right after two homes that vie for the title of most southern home in the U.S. Our home, while we were in Key West, was a short boat ride away on the private island Sunset Key. We grabbed a golf cart for a great drive around the compound. This secluded retreat looked like a small village. The island itself is 27 acres large. On the island, we offer 37 guest cottages, fully furnished with full kitchens, uh, three baths. Uh, we have a private white sand beach, as well as a zero entry pool. We offer two restaurants. While the ever-present hammocks looked inviting, we wanted to experience a Key West tradition, sunsets on Mallory Square. This waterfront park is transformed into a seaside carnival midway every afternoon. There's plenty of entertainment. If you don't give us enough money to go home, I'll stay here and marry one of your daughters. <laughs> or son. <laughs> the town has a reputation for being gay friendly. It's all part of the live and let live atmosphere of the Keys. We found it's not a bad way to live. All too soon, another perfect day in Margaritaville comes to an end. <laughs> <laughs>